Okay. I believe I am recording. Yes, I am. Oh, I did it. Okay, great. I thought I was going to have to call my 10 year old in uh, to help again. Okay, so this is a little brief overview of how to read the um, transcript, the student transcript. Um, all of this stuff was sent to you by Ms. Harris. Um, you received this last year. We went over this last year, so it should be review. And um, as Ms. Harris says, um, I think that's a very important thing to say that, um, you know, repetition is a key to learning. Um, I've, yeah, I definitely agree with that. So, you know, the main things to look for in the transcript, this is going to be really quick. Just make sure that the obviously name, address, uh, OSIS number, all this um, biographical information is correct. And then, of course, the very important things are the um, actual mark and numeric equivalent for the classes. So at HSAS, you'll see that um, both the actual mark and numeric equivalent are the same. You don't need to worry about it. And in some other schools, um, they have a different grading system. So the actual mark might be a B plus, and then they give you the numeric equivalent. Um, this is where you know what term it is. So this is the year 2015 term two, which means spring of 2015 and um, the 2015-16 school year. Term one is fall, right? So it stacks, like the one that's the most recent goes up top. Uh, also, you'll see that there's the actual credits versus um, credits earned. Um, that's how many credits, actual credits is um, how many credits the student attempted, how many they earned is, you know, the other number right next to it. So this person um, did not get a credit, meaning that they failed a course. They got a 60 in global. Um, and so they attempted one credit, but they did not get it there. At the bottom is an exam summary. And this year, what you'll see with the exam summary, that's the Regents exams. Uh, and those exams, you will see anything from last year, at the end of last year, will say WA for waived. So what that means is they were waived because the students couldn't take them. We're in the middle of a pandemic, um, anything else, like we're still waiting to find out about what's going to happen with the Regents in June and we'll let you know um, as soon as we know you will hear from the school. Um, okay, so I think that's a good kind of just summary. I'll go into the next one, which is GPA and report cards. So um, a little bit about high school transcript report cards and GPAs. Um, so obviously there's um, two terms in, in um, New York City Department of Education lingo, they call them terms, but it's really semesters. There's a fall and spring semester each year. Um, there are two report cards that happen for each of those terms in the mid middle of the term. And then there are two times where the student's transcript is updated, okay? So um, in the fall, um, the fall term ends or the fall semester ends and the, the transcript update happens then um, in early February. And then again, it happens in June for the spring semester. Um, let me just scroll down to my, I took my own little notes here and these help me keep on track. Um, so we're gonna look down here in a second at a typical grading scale, but first, um, so we talked about that. Okay, so a, a couple of really important points. Um, when, you're, when you're looking at a student's GPA, um, when you look at that term average and then the cumulative average, which is all the terms added up together and averaged out, um, I will go down to the typical grading scale now. So when, we, when, we, um, when students get to the point where they're looking at colleges and applying to college, um, this is kind of what a typical grading scale is. It's translated into a 4.0 scale for college. So we do it on a 100 point scale and this is what it translates to. Now colleges um, have different um, ways that they recalculate grades. Sometimes you will see on the transcript um, that your child has grades from middle school and sometimes we get questions about the middle school grades, why are they there? Can we remove them? Um, we don't like those grades. Um, they're not good or whatever it is. We do not have the ability to remove those grades. However, some colleges do recalculate the grades and take out the middle school grades. They're not interested in the middle school grades. So 
an important takeaway from this is that um, when you get to that point where you're visiting colleges or you're doing virtual visits, you want to ask the question, how do they recalculate grades on the transcript? A couple really important things to note. Um, the GPA is one of the most critical factors that colleges look at, and we'll talk about that more. Ms. Harris will talk about that definitely as well. Um, when you apply to college, really the GPAs that they're seeing are from the ninth, 10th, and 11th grade. Sometimes for students who apply early decision or early action, they'll see the first quarter grades, they, they will get the first quarter grades of senior year, but typically it's those first three years, okay? Also, AP courses receive a weight of 1.1, okay? So for, um, for example, let's say I get a perfect 100 in uh, AP calculus, which absolutely would have never happened and I wouldn't have never, <laughs> I would have never taken it because I hate math, um, <laughs> but I might have in English. So let's say I got a perfect 100 in English. What that would mean is it actually, with the weight of 1.1, I would have had 110. When you look on the transcript though, at an AP course, and let's say your child got a perfect 100, you will see it listed next to the course on that transcript. Um, well, I was gonna go up to the transcript, but I'm not gonna, I just realized they're all in different um, links. Um, you will see that as a 100 and it will be, it, the, the weighting only goes into the term and the cumulative average, okay? so you won't see it in the actual um, grade. You'll see it in the average. So it's a little tricky that way. That's the way the Department of Education does it. So again, this is a typical grading scale. Um, we try to share this every year. We shared it with the students as well. Um, on to Naviance. Let me just make sure. Oh, no, before I get to Naviance, I wanna talk a little bit about the Remind app. First, I'm gonna have a drink of water. Okay, Remind is something that we use to reach out to students. Um, and we recently had a meeting with the 10th grade students, a classroom guidance meeting, where we gave them their code to sign on to Remind. We use Remind just for very brief announcements like, hey, you know, um, your uh, form is due, don't forget that the due date is this Friday and things like that. Um, we keep it strictly between counselors and students. And really the reason for that, our rationale, our philosophy is that um, we want to encourage student ownership and responsibility of their high school process. And that's excellent practice for the college process, which we'll get into in a little bit later. Um, helping them learn responsibility and, um, and self-advocacy um, at an early age really helps them um, be better prepared for college. So parents, if you have signed on to uh, remind, there was, you know, I think I sent an email that was a little confusing and I apologize for that. I'm not even sure exactly what I said, but um, <laughs> if you, <laughs> what was that, Ms. Harris? I sent it when I was sending the, the, the transcripts. And again, we really wanted to rely on these extra forms of communication. But again, just for simple, like often it's like check your email. It, we, we got this program because it's free and uh, students weren't checking their email. And of course the pandemic came along and we all have like eight email addresses. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So um, sorry for that, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so sorry, but yeah, if you signed up, we'll, you know, like, please, I guess we'll take you off. Um, and parents who are thinking of signing up for a reminder who got confused about it, just know it's, it's strictly for, for your child. Um, and it's just a way for us to keep in communication. And also um, students, um, and please encourage your um, kids to remember this, um, if you have something longer to discuss with us, you know, um, that, you know, is longer than a text that should go into an email or we set up a meeting, right? But it doesn't really belong on Remind. So I'm going to move into Naviance. Okay. So first off, on February 3rd, both parents and students, 
<laughs> my cat is playing in the background. He's probably gonna attack me. I'm really sorry, <laughs> it's very distracting. Let me start over. February 3rd, both parents and students received um, your registration codes for Naviance, okay? We're gonna talk about what Naviance is in a second. Um, the email that you would have received that at is the same email that is hooked up to your Jupyter Grades account. So whatever you're getting, you're getting emails from Mr. Weiss. There was just an email about how, you know, they're planning to, you know, start high school, you know, is going to open back up again. Um, and, you know, he just sent an email about that, um, I, I believe yesterday, maybe the day before. Um, so whatever that email address is, that's the same one that we will have. On, that's the same one that, this is the cat. Um, that's the same one that we will have um, on Naviance. Okay, so a little bit about Naviance. What is it? It is a web-based college and career planning portfolio. So it helps students explore careers, uh, research colleges, and it's an application hub. Um, when your kids get to the end of junior year and into senior year, especially, they're going to be using it a lot. So the things that ninth and 10th graders um, are using it for right now is first, they're getting emails and you are getting emails from Ms. Harris and I um, through Naviance because we can send a mass email to a whole class or the whole school um, using Naviance. Um, so we send things about um, anything related to college planning, college applications to junior and senior uh, year kids, but we also send lots of summer opportunities uh, extracurriculars, things like that, that we come up, like we, we get in our um, inboxes. Um, it's also used for career exploration, and I'll get into that in a, a second. Um, researching colleges, there's um, on the student's homepage, there's a colleges tab. You can go in, you can just plug in a college and find all kinds of information and get a link to the school. Um, and, you know, for seniors um, and juniors, their college visits this year, they were virtual, um, but they're all listed um, on Naviance, like when they're happening. Uh, and as I said, it's a college application hub, which we'll get to um, later on. So how to view Naviance as a guest? Let me see if I can just get this a little. Um, the main thing you should know about this is that over the years, um, the functionality of the Naviance guest um, whatever, Naviance guest is very um, limited. You don't really see much. So the um, takeaway is to find that registration code, use it to get into Naviance, um, create a username and um, password, save that information so you don't lose it and make sure your child does too, okay? Because then you will have the parent facing um, Naviance interface and your kids will be signed up um, for Naviance and they really need that, um, you, you both do. So on careers, um, I'm just gonna say that there's a career interest profiler. It's a questionnaire and I think it's something that um, me and Ms. Harris usually do a um, paper and pencil version of this with the 10th graders in the fall. Um, obviously this year that could not happen. So we may be working on a way to use this instead um, and then find out, like talk through um, students' results. We're still working on that. That will be our upcoming um, sophomore classroom workshop. Um, and there's other things that are really worth tooling around and looking at. There's Road Trip Nation, which has a lot of different um, videos of people um, talking about their careers and their career paths. And then this gives you some information on researching colleges. So for the sake of time, um, I'm just going to just note that go to colleges, find your fit and supermatch. Um, supermatch is a way to, it's a search engine where you can plug in all kinds of information, um, you know, area that you want to live, size of a school, majors you're interested in, and it will spit out schools that fit those criteria. So that is Naviance 101 for ninth and 10th grade. Um, so I believe I have covered my part. I don't know, uh, Ms. Harris, do you think it would be a good time to take a couple questions or? Sure, and I'll uh, start sharing my screen and making okay. sure that my, uh, so you could feel the questions. And as okay, I- I'll stop my, my share. 
Okay, and <laughs> let me just, uh, yeah, okay, more. Let me get to the questions. Uh, suddenly I'm like, chat, okay, there we go. Oh, parents are waiting to be admitted to the meeting. Okay, I think they're in. Um, yes, we're recording the program. Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, oh, somebody's just noting that what you see on the New York City Schools account, um, your school report, attendance assessments. Um, okay. Um, do students slash parents set up their own college board accounts or does the school set that up? Um, you set that up. We do not set that up. Um, your college board accounts are something you set up on your own. Um, does the numeric equivalent take waiting for honors AP into account? So the numeric equivalent, again, on the transcript, it is a little confusing, but the Basically, at High School of American Studies, we are on a 100-point scale. So what you see as the actual grade and the numeric equivalent on your child's transcript will be exactly the same. And as I gave in the example, um, the, nothing will be in the numeric. Wait, what just happened? I just lost everyone. OK. Oh, I'm viewing your screen. OK. Um, so what? So you will see, let's say your child gets a perfect 100%. You will, you will see both 100 on both of those numbers, but you will see it reflected into the um, term average and the cumulative average, okay? Okay. Um, all right, and I'll, what is the login for the New York City Schools account? I believe that's Ms. Fiore provides that information. Is that correct, Ms. Harris? Um, the login is in the agenda. It's the, the not the login, the link to the site is in the agenda. I put that mm -hmm. and Ms. Fiore has to give you a code. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think that's it. I just, for some reason, I lost my, um, I lost my view of other people, but I can figure it out. I know, I'm like, uh, I'm all confused with this. Every time I go on, it works differently. Well, there we go. Yeah. Okay. 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 Go ahead, Ms. Harris. Okay. Oh, somebody's waiting to get in. So if I look down, uh, families, I apologize because some of my notes are on the uh, sheets. So basically the big thing that happened and the big thing, um, one of the biggest challenges that I have had as a counselor for the many, many years at, at American Studies is this whole um, area of testing. Why wouldn't that be an issue? That's how the kids got into school. They took a test to get, to get into school. And the testing whole, the whole, there's been a history of testing issues. And then of course the pandemic came along and it, it, it very abruptly upended the testing realm. But that said, we have a position and we have a stand on tests. And while there's no pressure right now, there are some things and some jobs that would be appropriate at the 10th grade age to, um, to be looking at. I'm just, I'm playing around with this. I only see myself, it's very disturbing. I like, okay, I see Ms. Teslick, as long as I see one other, other face. So one of, the, one of the key things that you would want to do as a 10th grader for those students that are out there is understand the differences between the SAT. These tests aren't that different, but the timing is different. The pacing is different. All US colleges accept both. Um, they're very, very closely related because in 2016, SAT did a massive redesign. ACT was picking up in steam. I remember many years ago, we had one or two taking the ACT. I would say we're like 70, 30, some years, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit more. Also the DOE, which we'll talk about, you know, they, they um, have a, a contract with the college board that's the model has changed every, uh, every year. Uh, so anyway, so Basically, the essay has been is being phased out of the SAT. Of the SAT, um, it does not count towards your total score. The essay, by the time the students start taking it, there will be no SAT on the 
uh, essay on the SAT and the ACT is probably likely to follow. So for the job for the students to do really is not to take a million practice tests, not to worry, but just to look at the format of the two tests. I don't think anybody can tell somebody else what, um, what test would be best for them to take. That would be something that's really up to the students, maybe doing one practice test. Some of the research also shows that repetition is the key to learning, as I always say. And that holds true on these standardized tests. Think about taking the SHSAT. How many practice tests did you take? Sometimes people will take a course or uh, they'll take a test, then they'll take a course, then they'll take a test, and they'll think that the course really helped when in fact it's just the repetition of taking the test. I think the days of people taking the SAT and ACT four and five times, th three and four times, maybe twice will be the max. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So the job for a 10th grader, in, if they want to plan ahead, is not to take the test, but to study the format of both tests look at the practice questions, look at the pacing. Um, there's many things on the, on the uh, internet. I try to pull up, by the way, most of the articles, I try to pull up things that were uh, written during, uh, during the uh, pandemic. So that's this article and every article that I pull up, you will see has, I'm just trying to move this out of my way. Hold on a second. Gotta see where to put this. Um, Okay, I want it on the side here. All right, so I'll go to my next handout. But um, as, as I mentioned on, on all of the handouts, on the top of the handout, if it was an article that was clipped from the internet, you will have, um, and all of these were sent to you in PDFs, so you can get the link if you want. They're just, you know, from blogs and websites that we like to use. Okay, so next, next handout, uh, let's see, okay. Okay, so this this was the handout that I sent to you in like 12 parts. Um, the reason I sent it in 12 parts is because the file was too big. On Naviance, we can't really send very large files over Naviance. Compass Prep, uh, we've actually, with a conjunction with the PTA, they are a tutoring company. We are not allowed to promote any fee for services. However, they have amazing free resources and you might wanna jot down Compass Prep. They provide us with free guides. I met the guy that owns the company. They, they were really a California based company and now they have presence all over the United States. And I have found over the years, their resources hands down are the best. So what I did with that super large handout was just to cut out the pages I thought that are most important. And of course, the FAQ page is always very important. And this is the table of contents for the whole book. So students, these are the questions. You don't have all of these questions, but you have some of these questions. This is the, the, the time in your um, educational career, not to worry about these things, but to plan for these things and to plant seeds in your head. So when the time comes, um, you will be prepared. So again, you'll notice the page numbers are all jumped, you know, jump all over the place. So college admission and testing. Okay, I just wanna look at some of my own notes. Um, again, the Varsity Blues scandal, the pandemic, these things have really, really um, upended. There's been lots of arguments about testing for many, many years. There's a website I will refer to called Fair Test. Um, test optional movement has been in play long before the pandemic, but it just like catapulted in the pandemic. So basically, um, we said the essay, the essay will, will be going to be you know, discontinued. SAT subject tests, which HSAS students took a lot of, were, were discontinued. So these things were just announced. And again, we expect that the ACT will do the same. The ACT, interestingly and historically, colleges that used to require subject tests would take the ACT instead of subject tests because that's what the ACT was. It was like little subject tests. Um, but again, the a, um, SAT had a big redesign. 
Now this graph is a very interesting graph here. They didn't do this study. The, every year, this, the NAC Act, the National Association for College Admissions Counselors studies, um, does a, conducts a survey. And I just wanna add that this compass, this company, they track 400 colleges. There are thousands of colleges. They cater to more competitive uh, students, to moderate, to highly competitive colleges. And if you download, we'll send a link to their whole book, or you can just Google it, it'll come right up. You can download a free copy. They update it twice a year. So basically the study from 2019, we didn't get one, shows the important criteria of what goes into a college application. And prior to maybe not including the pandemic test scores, will never override the GPA and the strength of a student's curriculum. And, and just to go back to the, the, um, the position that we, we have to face all the time in a specialized high school is, is, the, is the students took a test to get into school and it's like what they live and breathe and they're good at taking tests. Now we know that the mayor and the chancellor or the ex-chancellor, there's a movement to disband the um, specialized high schools. Some are for that, some are against that. It, it, it does wrap into politics as does some of this, but we, we are in a specialized high school. Um, it, it is not being compromised or changed, um, but this is basically what the message to the students is that, and the reason why test optional has become so prevalent is people are just, um, it's an access and equity issue. And also some people feel it doesn't show what you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. The counter argument always, and the, 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 the way that the SAT and the ACT were derived is that studies show this correlation, there's a, co a relationship between success in college level work and the score that you achieve on those tests. So you have the different camps, you have the different arguments. And this is a time like we send out that newspaper to start um, studying that stuff. So test optional, test optional. Um, flexible policies have, have helped colleges admit uh, more broader, you know, admissions pools. And this has been the trend. So we had the pandemic came in March of 2020. So these were all test optional, test flexible schools. Um, uh, th this, this year for the class of 2021, many, 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 many students were not able to take a test. That is not true in HSAS. At HSAS, we gave the school SAT on March 4th and the school closed on March 17th. Most of the students that applied did apply with at least one test exam. Um, but again, this changed the landscape forever. Uh, the, the many more students applied to colleges that they, not in our school in general, applied to colleges that they might not have ever considered because they never thought they had the score to get into those types of schools. Um, students at specialized high schools, students who have the ability to take these tests, again, are going to seek out the tests. Now with this company, and again, we don't promote the company, but they have fantastic free handouts. With their clientele, they have not seen a reduced interest in students wanting to take specialized high school tests. And as I speak about this testing issue, I will, I will tell you um, what we found, what, what, what happened and how it played out. So this is just, again, a little graph. See, this is very, very um, uh, dense in text. But some notes I wanted to tell you is that we know that the testing conditions, although a kid just told me a test in the 11th grade got canceled, you know, tests are still being canceled, but eventually the pandemic is going to fade away now that the vaccination is here. And what happened is, let me just use this graph as an example. So there were the, the schools, and if you go to fairtest.com, fairtest.com, Many schools were test optional. Then a lot of schools came in, this is out of the schools that they follow, went on a one year trial period. 
Then those same schools that went on the one year and then you had multi, the multi-year trial period tended to be three years. So that will affect the class of 2023. Some of the schools that said that they were going to do a one-year trial announced we are extending. So we got a lot of emails. Some have gone test optional. Test free is also known as test blind. And test blind means they, you, you can send your test, but it won't be looked at. Test optional is very interesting because we've never, we don't have a history of kids going test optional, but because the HSAS kids didn't get to take it the multiple times they would have liked, one or two students did go test optional with their early schools. And then when I re looked a little closer, I, I'm thinking of one case in particular, I re-advised the students at American Studies across the board usually hit the 90th percentile in the SAT and the ACT. Just I'm giving you very rough, rough numbers. So what test optional is, is like once you check that box, you cannot take it back. You can't then go take a test and say, oh, I changed my mind. I got, it's a commitment that you make. It's not an American Studies thing. Uh, let's just see. Um, but there's a lot for you as families, as 10th grade students to be watching. Um, basically, what this company found is that with, with the whole test optional surge, they saw a 30% drop in uh, test taking in, their, in the colleges that they survey. So in, again, the job for the 10th grader the job for the 10th grader and student, this is not, this is something you have to do for yourself is to take maybe a practice test. Maybe you don't even need to do a full length practice test. Understand the, that they, the, the concepts are similar, but they're executed in a different way. Um, there are all these concordance charts. A 1350 on the SAT concords and converts to a 29. This has been studied and studied and studied. So here you have a chart. And again, I try to cut the pages that I thought would be like a perfect 1600 equates to a 36, a 1590. So anywhere from a 1570 to a 1600 is a 36. We get, we've had one or two 36s, we've had 35s. 34 is, is a pretty, 33 and 34 are pretty like I would say the middle 50th percentile um, SAT scores at American Studies. So comparing SAT scores and ACT scores, they really, again, I think their resources are fantastic, always compare them with other things, but they kind of came out with this chart and most students, especially the students that are savvy test takers will fall in the judgment call. Again, after mess, much discussion over many years with Mr. Weiss and just human behavior and psychology, I'm the thought of pick with pick one and stay with one because of the repetition. I've seen it all. I've seen kids jump all over the place and try both and just to see. I don't think that's the best use of time. That's my own opinion. Um, and I will say when it is my own opinion, when we suggest switching, and again, this is in the era of kids taking multiple tests, like at least three. If you take the SAT twice and you're you know, at a certain, it's not even a score, but rather a percentile, that might be a chance to look at the other test. But with some really good uh, studying beforehand, I think, I think that could really be avoided. So again, we have just the charts here to familiarize yourself. This book is what, you know, it's like 50 pages, you know, it's like a workbook. We would give it out. It looks like this, you can download it. I don't, I have to email them. It's a 75 page booklet. So Ms. Teslick and I just pulled out the pages that we feel are very useful. And again, that is what our job is. Uh, just to um, synthesize material for you uh, and save you time. This is all about using time wisely. So senior and junior years, okay, early testing. They have three testing timelines. I saw a move in my years at American Studies of students moving from the standard test, 
testing timeline to the early testing timeline. That would mean taking the SAT in November or the ACT in December, maybe taking it again in March and April and being done with your college testing in the, um, by the end of 11th grade, you come to, you know, you come to senior year, um, you're done with your college testing. We definitely saw a jump from the traditional testing timeline, which would be a little bit in senior year and a little bit like taking it, whoops, taking it in the um, March of, let's say we're talking SAT or ACT, March or April, this was the traditional timeline. But students, I'm speaking to you now, even though I don't see you because my boxes are weird, but thankfully I see Anna and I see Ms. Teslick and I see some faces. Um, students, you just because your friend might be following one Tesla test, timeline doesn't mean that's for you. Everybody, this is where the college process, the thing I like about it, it's, it's different for everyone. And it's, time, it's a time to really look at yourself and say, what's good for me? Even though my best friend is doing X, I need to do Y. And there are options. There are different pathways that lead to the same place. So really try to really keep that, that thought in mind. So PSAT 10, you would have taken it this year. The DOE, the DOE, again, I was in a pilot school where they started when they started paying for the PSAT. So what the DOE has done the last few years, I wanna just remember this correctly, is that they, would, they paid for the PSAT 10 and you, you would take that the same day that the juniors were taking the SAT. This year, they did not fund the, P the PSAT. It was not offered. It does not count for anything. It is only practice at the 10th grade level. This is the structure of the PSAT. Um, the timing, again, we know class studying is about studying the structure of the test. The content is then the, you know, filling in the puzzle. Uh, the PSAT is scaled a little differently than the SAT. The highest score you can get is a 760, where the highest score that you can get on the SAT is an 800 per section, per section. So what I want to say next is about the National Merit Scholarship. So the DOE stopped funding the PSAT for 11th grade. That usually comes and God willing, school will be open. The anticipated date for the PSAT, um, wait, let me scroll back. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. So just so you can mark your calendars. Forgive me, the technology I've had to learn has been just unbelievable. Um, well, actually I didn't have to scale back, but I'm doing it anyway, okay. The anticipated date for the PSAT, which will impact this grade, is October 13th, 2021. So we always gave it in school um, on a Wednesday, and we were not a Saturday site, and the DOE does not fund the PSAT for 11th grade, but it's only about a $15 test, and if you apply for a fee waiver, it is free. Now, again, hoping that school will be normal by October, we will set up an order, we will have you take that test because taking a PSAT as an 11th grader is what qualifies you for the National Merit Scholarship. The National Merit Scholarship, and there are alternate ways if you don't take um, the PSAT, you can sometimes use SAT scores. They've done that in the past. They particularly did that now, but there is some cachet about the National Merit Scholarship. So when you take it as a junior in October, 2012, this is, you know, this is using October, 2020, we always have many, 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 I would say a good like 20 like students, 25 students may be commended. We have several that go to the semifinalist and finalists and occasionally we have a winner. When you get to the semifinalist rung of this contest, um, you, your name is in a book and it goes to all of the colleges at 
um, a particular time of the year. So it, 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 and there is cachet on a resume. If you're into status, there is a reason I feel to take the, um, as the way things stand now. And again, this could get phased out. I don't think the college board wants to go out of business. SAT subject tests, obliterated, gone. Um, why did they cancel those? I'm not exactly sure. I think a lot of students didn't know about them. I think uh, we were pushing our kids always to take world and US. Um, but the question now is how, what does this mean for AP exams? My suspicion from what I've read and even a little flutter of behavior that I'm seeing is that SAT subjects, I mean, AP scores are gonna going to um, take a, a, a different role in the college application. I mean, we offer seven. And if you ever wanna see what, uh, there was one test program called this test optional, test blind, tests required, and tests flexible. What tests flexible means, and this was, let's go back before the pandemic, test flexible would allow students NYU's website would be a great example. Test Flexible would allow students to submit like two subject tests and three, you know, AP scores. They wanted some kind of testing, but it didn't necessarily um, have to be the, um, the SAT or the ACT. Um, I believe, um, I believe that we will see uh, a use, a different use with the um, AP exams board. So I think I have one more handout on this testing section, which I'm going to look for. And this is an opinion piece. I cannot say that I agree with it or disagree. I'm not going to put those opinions out there. But inside higher ed, I was once in that magazine. This was, again, written during the um, uh, this was written during the pandemic, September 14th. So this fall, there was a very big lawsuit, which is very interesting because California always required subject tests. Not only did they require the SAT and the ACT, but the nine universities always required these extra subject tests. So there was a whole lawsuit and then the split, there was a split. So Berkeley, Santa Cruz and our Irvine, um, we're gonna stay test optionals, whereas the other campuses out of the nine UCs, we're gonna go test optional. A judge threw that out, then the pandemic came. I don't know how these large universities are doing it with test blind. This is the answer we don't have for you. How are they doing it? How are they taking the kids this year? Did they take all the kids that sent in a test and put them in one pile and then judge them together. I hate to use the word judge. And did they take the non-test submitters and put them in a pile? Like we don't have that secret. And if we had it, we'd share it. We don't have it. We have yet to uncover that mystery, but there is a real push in certain um, circles, certain circles to accelerate this. Again, that's, I've mentioned this uh, the test national center for it's called um, fair test national center for fair and open testing. This has been a movement for a very long time way before the pandemic. And there's a lot of people, um, you know, we hear of this name can be a lot about, you know, the biases in 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 these tests, and it harms certain uh, segments of the population and it, it's an argument. It's an argument and it's an argument that has trickled down to the, um, to the specialized high schools, which we've been following now for a few years. So please feel free to read this article on your own and make your own opinions. Um, but it's something that you need to be watching. Students, parents, what the trends are inside higher ed is the mag is the newspaper for the college, you know, this is, the paper. This is where we get the articles from there in our feed. And um, testing is something that, let me wrap it up by saying students, you're more than a test score, you're more than a GPA. That's the whole discussion on activities. 
What we did see is everybody did submit, and I think what we stand by and what I, at least for the class of 2022, is that everyone should make it their business if they can to figure out how to take one test. We are likely offering the in-school SAT with social distancing. Um, things should be cleared up, but this, this taking the test two, three, it doesn't even look nice at this point when kids couldn't get any tests. There was one kid I was working with that were like trying to go, you know, driving 25 miles, going to, I said, don't send all those tests. It doesn't even appear nicely when people couldn't even get a spot to take one test. So watch, read, read the stuff we send. Um, we, we, we send that newspaper. I try to send it every, uh, you know, we try to send that council week that has all the articles and, uh, We'll take some questions on uh, the testing. If anybody has, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll see if anybody has any. Um, uh, so there, any there is one question on um, the SAT and ACT taking it early in the junior year. It's like the, the last one in the chat. Can you see it? Uh, I can let this. Um, you can read it to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, not to. I understand that some schools encourage kids, this is from Jillian, um, to take the SAT slash ACT early in their junior year, October or November, so that they get it out of the way before the year gets busy and aren't studying at the same time in the spring as with the APs. Are HSAS students at a disadvantage in the timeline since most kids have not yet taken Algebra 2? Is that necessary for the SATs slash ACTs? Okay, that's an excellent question question you can hear me and and part of it I have the answer to and part of it I don't if you go um as far as the content and the math content and what might have gotten missed and I I worked on a big thing with Mr. Halliby about the actual content when we were when we were promoting certain SAT subject tests the two the in that book there are three timelines the early timeline the standard timeline and the delayed timeline. Again, it's all, if you apply to college early decision, you could still take an SAT like in October, it takes about three weeks. Some early decision schools, not many will allow you to take a test in November. So it, it, it depends on a few things. I'm not addressing the math, but it depends on um, if you're planning to apply early, if you've researched your schools and you know what their policies are. But my thing is really looking at when the APs are, and again, this is gonna be much easier once things return to normal, knowing that the APs come in May, looking at the dates that the tests are offered, both by the way, SAT and ACT added prior to the pandemic and with the pandemic, they have added, this is the booklet, these are all my tabs, um, they have added additional test dates in the summer to facilitate the earlier testing timeline. Some kids want to be done with their testing when they start their senior year because they know they're applying early and they know they wanna leave room and they're ready. As far as actual content of math, that would that you would need to there is a section in these books you can look at what the problems are we normally would have booklets that we give out um but that would also be worthwhile consulting with a math teacher um but i i, I again different roads lead to the same place i don't know if that fully answered the question but i i tried any other questions on college testing um i think that's um, i think that one can I ask a question? Sure. I didn't type it. Um, if they do take the test, the child takes the test more than once, do you have to send in both results? Or I know schools talk about super scoring, but they still see them all, correct? If they do that? They're, okay, that's a great question. I didn't, I didn't even get into that. That, you know, we had to pick and choose after 17. So this it's called score choice, super scoring on the ACT it's called. Also, ACT, right before the pandemic, was planning this big move where, okay, so, so, okay, let me break that down. That's an excellent question. So super scoring, let's say you take two SATs, you then could um, 
if you don't like the full score on one and you want a super score, you're forced to send both so they can combine the scores. If you had a higher reading on one and a higher, whatever it is. Some schools, even if you took it twice and you're happy with just the one score and you're not looking to combine, they have a policy. And now I wouldn't mess around with the policy. I don't know if it's on the honor system or they actually can get in and see how many times you've taken it. I do not have that answer, but some schools, they want to see all your tests. ACT has super scoring, same thing, where they combine the sections. You take, remember, kids used to take it two or three times. So they would, they, you can merge them together to get an overall higher composite score. The big thing that ACT was planning but got halted because of the pandemic, they were going to allow section retesting. So instead of redoing the whole ACT, let's say you just wanted to take one of the math sections again. So that's something to be watching. The, the, the point of tonight's meeting, and again, I, I, I'll end with this and say, sometimes I, I, over my years at American Studies, I'd walk out of these classroom presentations, not the family night so much, and the kids felt more pressured and more stressed. And our intention was just to be like, wow, we're giving you all these handouts. We want to give you information. We want you to feel informed. We want you to know that we're on top of this stuff. Not, but it had the reverse effect. This is just a time to really plant seeds, know what's coming, know that it's changing. Some things are going to be go back and some things aren't. We, we, there's a lot of unknowns for us. And the big, I'll say it again, the big unknown for us is how did the colleges do it? What was their methodology? And if I was out going to professional development, you know, at these conferences and having a few drinks, I'd get it out of someone, but we haven't had those opportunities. So that's what we have to, that's our job to find out how the colleges did it without the tests. Any other questions on testing? Okay. We're going good on time. Good. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to like uh, jump ahead. So I shared my screen. Good. Um, okay. So yeah, we've gone through a lot about testing and we're just going to jump up to talk a little bit about programming for rising juniors. Um, and first, um, I created this handout to help me understand math and because um, sometimes there are questions about math. So just very quickly, um, there are about three different routes for math for um, students. I know that my route would have been this one, quote unquote, regular. So this is my terminology. I used it, you know, like, so just for myself, but ended you know, up that handout came from Colleen. And now I know that I remember now the mystery is solved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I created this so I would understand, um, you know, last year when I it was my first year, so I would understand how the math sequence works at um, HSAS, because um, it's different from my previous school. That's so, a Catholic cheat sheet. <laughs> yes, it's my cheat sheet, and you're, you're privy to it. Um, so algebra one and two, um, ninth grade, then geometry, 10th grade, algebra two, trig, 11th grade, and then you would take like um, vectors and ma matrices, I hope I said that right, I don't even know how to pronounce it right, um, and pre-calculus in 12th grade, you know, because there are four years of math required for the HSAS endorsed um, diploma. So then there are some students who um, already go in, they've tested in, they've taken algebra before, and they do the more advanced route where they take an advanced algebra for one semester, hop into geometry, and you see how then they kind of accelerate into being ready for AP calculus. And then there's the students in the middle who maybe started in the same place I would have started with algebra one and two. And then they are like, ah, I really like math. I'm doing well with math. And they decide that they want to make sure that they can accelerate and get to um, the point where they can take calculus. And in order to take calculus, they must take pre-calculus in junior year in the spring. So what those students tend to do, um, not tend to, what they do is they take algebra two trig semester two in spring of their junior year 
and they add pre-calculus and that's called doubling up in math, right? Um, so that's just like my little cheat sheet to help you understand what the options are. Um, also, just to walk it back a couple steps, um, Mr. Hallaby will be having a meeting um, sometime in May with the students virtually. Um, and a lot of the handouts that he will go through will be virtual as well. Um, and he'll be talking them through the course selection for junior year. So I'm going to go to another handout, which is just some basic things to know about programming for rising juniors. Um, so as I said, there's a programming meeting in May this year. I have no doubt it will be virtual. Um, there, I'm certain that there will also be um, an email from Mr. Hallaby, who is our programmer, and also Mr. Weiss, just letting you know that this is coming and sharing the, um, the forms that will be shared with your kids. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for the forms. Um, there's typically somewhere from one, two, three different forms where the students go through and make their course selections for anything from if they want to do um, they want to do honors level English or they want to do the AP level um, English for junior year um, and, and so on and so forth. So definitely discuss programming options um, with your kids and make sure you know you talk through all of the possibilities and make sure they're making the choice that, that fits them best. Um, and most students are granted the, cor the courses that they are requesting. Of course, there are also always like limitations with you know, space in the course or qualification for courses. Um, some AP and college courses, students have to have a certain average. Um, for English, I think that they have to um, write an essay to show that they're ready for um, the level of composition that they would need to do. So there are prerequisites and those are also outlined in the, um, the HSAS um, um, academic policy handbook, which is also shared on our website. Um, AP courses, yeah, same thing that I just said, each course has specific requirements. College courses are subject to academic qualifications um, they're also subject to negotiations between the Department of Education and CUNY. Um, and the way it works is that when students like list the courses that they're most interested in, they, they um, rank them. And then they, were, they will be notified first, whether they were placed into a college course and second, which course. And also just very, very important to note um, for students who are taking college courses in the fall, uh, the college schedule at Lehman is different from ours, and that means that they have to start those courses typically before Labor Day. Um, so that is, you know, programming in a nutshell, and we're going to jump back into some college exploration stuff. So um, I put together some tips uh, that I found online um, at one particular um, site, which I've um, made sure to put down here, College Vine, adapted from College Vine, but I tweaked them a little bit for the pandemic. Um, so this is just an outline of like, if you have these questions about like, what should you be doing at home and thinking about now in 10th grade, um, what should you and your teens um, be doing and preparing for and how can you prepare? Um, so first, you know, most importantly, have conversations with your kids. Um, talk to them, not necessarily about like how their grades and how they have to get up their grades. I mean, that's important. Um, but, you know, saying if they don't get their grades up for college and not gonna get into a good college is not gonna really get the conversation going. But I'm talking more about things that have to do with their likes and dislikes and their values um, and interesting questions like, um, if you could plan the perfect day, what would it be? Um, things like this that are get you going, get you having conversations um, that can be difficult sometimes for you know, parents and teens to do. Um, but this really helps facilitate when you guys are getting to the point where you do need to talk more in depth about college and choices. Um, you've already sort of laid that, um, that, that foundation. Um, 
model and encourage good habits. This is some stuff on time management. There's something called the Pomodoro technique. I won't go into it, but definitely check the links that are in here. Um, study skills, whenever I talk to students about study skills, and we do this, we did this in ninth grade when we went into the ninth grade classes, um, we do a learning styles inventory where we have them ask some questions to figure out what their learning style is. Um, you know, some people are more auditory, some people are more visual, they got to write and, and read and, and highlight everything. And some people are more um, tactile, kinesthetic, they need to touch things and move around like they're better in science. So knowing yourself um, and what your learning style is, is really important. And then just modeling, I just want to like highlight this. Encourage and model self care eight hours of sleep, healthy food, getting outdoors as much as you possibly can. Um, the weather was really nice today. It was nice to get out. Um, you know, a lot of students are not getting much time to socialize. Anytime you can encourage them to fit it in um, is really, really important. Um, and, you know, it's all about good habits that they carry on into college. Um, encouraging independence. Um, encourage like engaging in problem solving skills with them. If they're having an issue with us, the counselors, if they're having an issue with their teacher or with um, a, a friend, you know, problem solve with them. What's the problem? Identify some solutions, have them pick out what they think is the right solution and then they go forth and enact it. I also just wanna highlight, and you know, we say a lot about this. Um, where did I put it? Um, don't write the email to me or Ms. Harris for your child have them do it, okay? So that's all about them learning to take ownership, to speak for themselves. Um, and, you know, advocating for themselves is gonna be something they really need for college. So this is all about college preparation and life preparation. Um, consider college visits during a pandemic. So um, there are a lot of virtual visits. I've done some of them. Here's a few links um, that I put in here. Uh, and they're, you know, they're not as good as actually being on the campus, but you know we have to make do with what we have. Um, also, just visiting local nearby schools or schools in the area, maybe that your child and you have no interest in, but still just getting on the campus, taking a look at it, walking around. You don't even have to go on a, a like a, an actual tour because right now a lot of tours aren't even happening, but just stepping on campus, it really gives you a sense of the school um, and you can even combine it with a virtual tour and walking the campus. I did that with um, Bard this summer and it was, it was a really good experience that helped me get a better sense of Bard. Um, so, and then educating yourself on the college process. There's a couple links in here that we talk about a lot. The high school counselor weekly um, we send, um, Ms. Harris sends like religiously every week. There's also a lot of um, good podcasts. Um, so just, you know, educate yourself on the process. And also that goes also with financially. Um, you can go to college websites and look at their EFC or estimated family contribution calculators, plug in some numbers and just start getting an idea of what um, the next steps are gonna look like money-wise um, because things change a lot from, from, you know, five years ago until now. Um, so that's important to check it out. So that's just the basics of, uh, you know, some tips that I thought might be handy at this particular time. Um, the next thing is, uh, I'm going to have a drink of water. Ah, that's delicious. Okay. A snapshot of the HSAS college application pro uh, procedures. So I'm not going to go through all of this. This is something that we have for you. We present it. It's, a, it's the same thing where repetition is key and giving you a sense of, well, what happens throughout the course of ninth and 10th grade? And then going into junior year, what happens, right? And then you see how things pick up going into spring of junior year, summer, into um, all the way through until you know, June, you know, we're sending the final transcript to the one college that students will be attending. So this gives you a roadmap so you know what to expect. We all do better when we have a roadmap, roadmap and we know what's coming next, okay? So what we're doing tonight is part of building that. Um, we are having a, 
a night where we talk a lot about college, about testing, um, and give you some information to help educate yourselves. Um, you know, there'll be definitely things coming up at this time, junior year. There's something called the self recommendation that students fill out that we use um, based on they they answer a lot of um, in depth questions and we use that to help uh, along with our meetings with them. We have a junior meeting, individual meeting, college planning meeting, and also a senior college planning meeting. Um, and using all of that, that helps us write their counselor recommendation. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next thing. High school versus college. Um, if, yeah, if you could just take a second, parents. Actually, I'm not going to go to that yet. If you could just uh, throw in the chat your answer to this question. Um, where did I put it? <laughs> what was the main difference between high school and college for you? And it can be just a quick answer. I know mine would be freedom. <laughs> so, and we'll just, um, maybe um, Ms. Harris, if you can pull up the chat and read like five or 10 of them or something. The very thing you said, freedom. Let's see, <laughs> somebody else. Uh, let's see, schedule your responsibility and no parents. Got to focus on what I wanted to learn, independence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, independence, freedom, got to focus, uh, independence, more personal freedom. Good answers. Yes. yes, that's all what we're talking about. And with freedom comes responsibility. <laughs> so this is just a little high school versus college comparison sheet that's kind of good, important to be thinking about, and especially for, for you know, the students who are here tonight. You know, um, a lot of, basically a lot of what happens in high school is things are structured for you. They're imposed upon you and oftentimes not to your liking. Um, <laughs> but um, a lot of that structure gets taken away in college. Um, instead of meeting every day for classes, you meet maybe once or twice a week. Um, it's up to you to make it to class on time. Um, you know, um, you, the, I think there's a little bit about studying and testing, like, you know, studying, you really have to do a lot of time management and figure that out on your own. Um, and as far as um, meeting with your instructors um, at HSAS, like they're there all the time in, in the typical year, right? Like during lunch, they're available. After school, they'll pull you aside. Um, when you get to college, that's not how it works. Um, they have um, specified office hours, you come to those office hours, but, um, you know, depending on the school, there is some variability. If you're going to a, like a smaller college, that's, you know, like you're going to have a more um, chances for one on one kind of um, interactions with your professors. Um, anyway, um, testing is a lot different too. It typically um, is infrequent and covers a larger amount of material. Um, and, and I think, you know, just um, some things about personal freedom, you know, you're responsible for your own actions and consequences, you manage your own time. Information about your college success or failure cannot be shared between the college and your parents because there is a law called FERPA, uh, which says that when you're 18, that is your information, right? So you have to choose to share it with your parents. Um, so you get a lot of freedom but there's also a lot of responsibility there. Um, I think that that was everything for me. So Ms. Harris, I am going to hand it back to you, okay? okay. I'm gonna and I'll sh stop sharing. Okay, and I'm gonna share my screen, share. And um, interestingly, when I get to that chair, okay, so we're up to number 13. So, no, where is my number? Oh, where is my handout? Whoops, I'm missing one. Uh-oh, I forgot to open Ms. one. Harris, I might be able to pull it up. Yeah, if you could pull up number 13. I forgot to get so it. So right. share your screen and I'll, and I'll pull it up. Okay, wonderful. Let's see. Okay. I'm stopping your screen sharing. Ha! 
Okay. Okay. Hope this is the right one. And okay. I so was uh, number 13. With numbering them 13. Yeah. So, okay. So basically we're at the home stretch. You've made it. We've hung on to everybody. I'm going to zip through these last um, parts. In fact, Ms. Tessic, in the interest of time, if you can pull up the handouts as I ask, that would make it easier for me because I see the way the people that I want them. One thing I am passionate about, and it's very interesting, I, this is my 17th year at American Studies. So when they came, when they were putting the school website together or whatever, I know it needs work, they asked, what do you want your caption to be? And my caption exactly 17 years ago is exactly the same. It's not about getting into college. It's about being in college. And the truth is that we really need to do much more work on careers. And Ms. Teslick and I try to do something with careers. Oh, I can't scroll. Scroll for a little bit from me. Maybe I should pull up my own. All right. So this, this handout is the 18 career fields for the, for the future. Again, printed November 3rd. 2020, I very specifically looked at things that were printed during the pandemic to see what the mood was and what things, I'll just read from some of my notes. Again, uh, the thing that, this is something that you can really, really be working on with the, with the students. The way that they came up with these careers was basically the fastest job growth, the comfortable wage and the projected jobs. So we see software developer, and it's just a nice handy sheet to start looking and thinking about jobs. And as I always say to a student, I dare you to look up something you never heard of. These are pretty standard jobs that most of us have heard of, but I say, I dare you to, um, to look at something uh, that you haven't heard of. Uh, basically, this stuff is gotten from the Occupational Outlook Handbook, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it's, I always think it's about a third, a third, and a third. I think a third of kids knows, I use that recipe for a lot of things. Um, I think a third of people know exactly what they want to do. I think a third of people, a third of individuals might have some idea, and a third of young students have no clue whatsoever. We know people change careers multiple, multiple times. And um, yes, I highlighted that job. It's good to understand you know, what you're like, what your energy is like, what kind of environment. And again, I feel at American Studies, we could even be doing more um, with this. We started, we got a career day going for the first time after years and years. And it's really, really important. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen so I could just scroll through the next couple of handouts, but, you know, look at this, think about it, think about some of these jobs, um, the educational requirements, some people don't want to be in school forever, the salaries, and then I have a couple of quick handouts from, uh, let me just share my screen, sorry for my forgetting to pull up one of my handouts, I have the rest here, I'm on number 14, okay. So these are the fastest growing jobs. Um, I pulled that up. Just again, a quick, charts are very easy. They're not too wordy. These, and you can compare this handout with the last handout. I went on this, I went on uh, last night. I was up to all hours, the fastest growing jobs. You'll always see the medical jobs, um, the home health care, the physical therapy assistance, the salaries. Very important to start like tracking these things, understanding these things. You know, you can't really fit to it, but it's nice to know. Um, you can't make a square go into a circle, a circle go into a square, but there are certain things like, I don't know what a, a, a solar photovoltaic installer is, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm not sure exactly what that, person does. And as I'd say, if I was in the class, I dare you to look it up. I dare you. Um, and then I pulled up for um, the highest paying jobs, which interestingly, still seem to fall and reside in the medical in the medical arena. And I love our nurses and nurse practitioners, but you saw some of the highest and again, this comes right out of the governmental website. You can't push yourself to be these things if it's not in your spirit to do so. 
But I think it's not, I think the hype on college is overriding the career research process and a well-directed career research process can reshape a college list. College lists look identical and it's by prestige of school, but sometimes some of these more way out programs or different kinds of things are just not offered at certain schools. We have seen definitely an uptick on students applying to larger universities um, than in the past. And um, this is my favorite handout coming up and we use this a lot with the students. And I used a new one for tonight. This comes out of a career uh, page on a college website. So basically this looks at the interdisciplinary social sciences. And this gives you an idea of somebody who's maybe, we have a lot of kids in, interested in the environment. What kinds of jobs? We have a lot of kids who are of course into political science. What's great about this handout, and we work with these with the students in the junior year, in the senior year, it gives you an idea of work settings. It gives you an idea, sometimes you'll see it's out of a Florida college, but you'll see sample employers. They'll con these, this handout really connects the dots as far as books you can read, um, websites that you can visit. Um, and really sometimes this could lead to, this is a perfect segue into the very last handout, the connecting the majors and skills but also I always tell the kids to really visit the, if they know they wanna do a certain thing, look at a professional organization website. Like we have two professional organizations. We have NACAC, National Association for College Admissions Counselors and New York State ACAC. And understanding about these facets of careers. And it's definitely something, I know that there's a lot of um, study time and this isn't always, um, there's not always time set aside from this, but sometimes I think well-directed career research or interest in careers could actually take a student who maybe wasn't that excited to school, about school, and maybe change the course of direction for his or her education and get them excited about something. And then lastly, lastly, that is the segue into this summer program piece. This handout, I was glad to see they updated it. I was glad to see, oh, maybe I did have my, my handout. So the, um, the guide to summer programs. Okay, so what happened years ago, colleges or that their campuses were empty and they had swimming pools and dorms and cafeterias and wonderful food. And they started filling up their program, their colleges with all these summer programs. Some of the summer programs are run by the college. Some, the college just rents out space. Some camps are held um, on college. So there's this whole, this is the time of year that a lot of kids apply for these uh, things, these programs. And this handout, what's good again, you have all the links in here. Will it help with the child's chance at admission? Well, if you go to a summer program at Harvard, run by Harvard, it's not gonna, get you into Harvard. In fact, sometimes it can be very, very unrelated. There are some top ranked summer programs. Most of the best ones are highly competitive and free and don't cost anything. Some of the, some of the ones are, some summer programs can be very costly. I think it's definitely a good use of time if it's something that the student is interested in, if, it's, if, if the student is interested in ruling things out also. There's never a waste of time, I tell students. If you went to some summer program and it didn't turn out to be that you don't wanna be a game designer after all, then you know that now, you know, and you figure that out now. Um, but again, one thing I can say that we've had a long pandemic. There are, there are summer programs in all areas, in STEM, in leadership. Every college runs a summer, our summer program. This is an area well worth researching. I've, we have a couple of kids applying for this one. I was writing recommendation letters today. Um, what happened with COVID was that a lot of them went remote last year. Some of them have already announced that they're going 
remote this year. Some kids, I was a surprise, some of the seniors that I work with this year did manage to get outdoors and do some kind of uh, programs. But the bottom line is that um, you, the student should not feel pressured. This is not necessarily going to make your or break your college application. It should be because it's something fun. It's something that brings you outside. It's something that you wanna try. Some of these programs position themselves to look like they're more competitive than they really are. They give the guidance counselors extra work. They, a lot of them, as you'll see in here, take as many as 80% of their students, but they just, they're selling something. It's not that they're bad. It's not that they're good, but it has to be right for the right moment in time. But I urge you, um, and I share my passion for career uh, counseling. And again, I wish I got to do more of it. And we really do work very hard, but it does go hand in hand and in tandem with a very well-directed college research and career research. They should run parallel. On a personal note, I don't really do any social media. I've never been on Facebook or Twitter or any, but I do have a LinkedIn account. And I got that because of a student, an HSAS student came storming in and said, Ms. Harris, we have to have a LinkedIn account. So on that LinkedIn account, it's really interesting. And I wish I had more time to look at it, but it's interesting to see what that kid from 2009 is doing or that kid from 2010 and how their careers have really shaped out. So look over some of those jobs and get excited about um, the, wor the world of work because it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun way to go into it. It's a more positive way than being so, um, so fixated on these acceptance rates at these colleges and the names. People make their own future. A college, uh, the power that's been given over to these colleges is, is, is quite remarkable. Um, and I think that pandemic is going to have some very significant impacts going forward. And I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. I always feel like the 10th graders are forgotten about. So we gave you more, we always gave, we, we gave you more. And um, that's my sections. And if anybody, we held on to most of you, but if anyone has any questions, comments, we're happy to stay on and take those. Yes, thank you. Um, and I, just want to um, echo what Ms. Harris said. Thanks for hanging on. Thanks for looking through everything. And I agree with everything she said about um, the career exploration is, is like a really excellent way to get to know yourself better as a student, as a person. Um, let's see, we've got a message. Oh, somebody said, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? You can post them in the chat or I guess. Um... Thank you, Mrs. Kessler. All right. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. We really appreciated you guys taking the time. And um, I will work very hard to figure out this recording and send it to everyone. <laughs> Pray for a normal fall, a regular fall. I'm not, not a regular fall. We will see you soon and we will speak tomorrow. Have a good evening. And thank you, class of 2023. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.